So now we'll be starting with coordination compounds. First, we will begin with the theory involved in this chapter. So for this chapter, first we have to basically understand what coordination compounds are. Coordination compounds are complex compounds of transition metals. Next, you need to understand the Werner theory. Werner theory basically talks about how coordination compounds ionize when they are dissolved in another solvent. So, for instance, what Werner basically did was he took these three compounds and he dissolved them and uh, like made them soluble in a solvent. So, when you dissolve this in a solvent, this particular compound, you will be able to get three moles of AgCl. In this case, you'll get two moles of AgCl. In this case, you'll get one mole of AgCl per mole of the complex compound that we initially began with. Now, as you can see, these are just the differences basically outside in the uh, valency outside the complex entity. So we can basically tell that our primary valency is variable and secondary valency is fixed as in inside the coordination entity we have 6 in each case. We have 6 ligands in each case. This is 5 plus 1, 6. This is 4 plus 2, 6. And in this case there are 6 NH3 ligands. And outside the uh, complex comp we have variable number of uh, chlorine ligands. Thus we call it a variable valency as the primary valency and we call secondary valency as a fixed valency. So this is the first concept that you need to understand. Now we will start with the next concept, ligands. Ligands are uh, ions or molecules that are bound to central metal, at metal atom to satisfy the secondary valency. We need to understand a few other concepts in this part. What are anionic ligands, what are cationic ligands and what are neutral ligands. Next we will understand what is the denticity of a ligand. Then we will go on to understand what is chelation and what are ambidentate ligands. So these are the major subtopics that we will understand in this part of the chapter. Uh, ligands are ions or molecules that are bound to the central metal atom to satisfy the secondary valency. We just seen what the secondary metal valency of a metal is. So ligands are the molecules, the ions which are bound to satisfy that valency. Denticity is the next concept is denticity. Denticity is the number of at like the number of ions, the number of pairs of electrons that a particular ion can donate to the central metal atom. So we can call them unidentate, bidentate or polydentate depending on how many pairs of electrons a particular uh, ligand is donating. So for instance chlorine, aqu aqua which is water and amine NH3 donate one pair each. So that is why we call it unidentate. Uni means one. Bidentate means two. So something like oxalate or ethylene diamine or any of these ligands donate two pairs of electrons. So that is why we call them bidentate. Polydentate is uh, a set of uh, molecules or ions which donate more than two, that is three or more uh, pairs of electrons. So EDDA, ethylene diamine, tetraacetate, 4 minus, this is an important ligand which you should remember, is an example of polydentate ligands. This is hexadentate. So this is the structure for this particular ion, this particular ligand. So next we will understand what is chelation. Chelation means basically this is a concept for bidentate and polydentate ligands. So what we do is bidentate and polydentate ligands which can donate more than two uh, two or more donor with two or more donor atoms. So basically what happens is you have a metal and you have the same ligand giving you more than two uh, from the same place. Uh, this is the ligand and it's giving you more than uh, two or more pairs of electrons, right? The same ligand. So we have a sort of a ring formation over here. This has at least say four particular points where a ring formation is like a sort of a ring is joined. So that is why that is called chelation that gives added stability. You will learn this further in detail in organic uh, where you'll study in general organic chemistry you'll actually study chelation in detail. Uh, next concept is ambidentate ligands. Ambidentate ligands are ligands which donate which can donate through more than two or more atoms uh, but only one atom at a time. Say for instance something like nitrite. So this is nitrito. It can donate through N because N also has a lone pair and it can donate through O. But one at a time because it will generate a partial positive over here. So it cannot don uh, donate through both the met atoms at the same time. So that is why we call it nitrito N and nitrito O depending on where the donation is happening from. Next we will see how to name the ligand part. Uh, so your ligand will you'll have to check whether your ligand is anionic or it is cationic or it is a neutral ligand. So for anionic ligands you change IDE to an O ending. You change ITE to ITO. ATE to ATO, for instance, chloride to chloro, nitrite to nitro, sulfate to sulfato. 
or uh, ditri tetra prefixes are used so for instance you have cl2 in your complex you'll write that as dichloro or uh, depending on how many you have you can actually just write it down that way or uh, three would be tri tetra this way we go on uh, now suppose you have something like ethylene diamine tetra uh, ethylene diamine tetra acetate okay so that already has a di inside the name right uh, somewhere within the name we have di in such cases we use bis tis tris or tetra kis these names so you'll write bis ethylene diamine tetra acetate something like that if di tri are already used uh, you use these particular conventions for all ligands except aqua amine carbonyl uh, also you will have to remember the common names for example oxalate o uh, uh, other such names uh, oxo and other such names which are commonly used for nomenclature these are given in your ncert textbook this is something important that you'll have to remember for nomenclature now the next important concept in this chapter is that of isomerism so you need to understand what isomerism is there are two types of isomerism isomerism basically you would have studied in organic as well it is basically the concept where the same structural form the same formula of the chemical compound can give you two or more types of structures so isomerism is in two forms stereo isomerism and structural isomerism stereo isomerism is further divided into geometrical and optical structural is further divided into linkage coordination solvate and ionization now we will first study what is geometrical isomerism which is a class under stereo isomerism geometrical isomerism basically is uh, there for 4 and 6 coordination number compounds so this is for instance a square planar compound and uh, this is the cis form as you can see both are on the same side and as you can see these are on the trans side opposite side so this is a trans compound uh, next for instance this is an octahedral compound now you can see that this is cis because both are on the same side they're together and the two chlorine atoms are uh, trans to each other they are on the opposite sides of the plane so that is why this is a trans compound next we will understand what is optical isomerism optical isomerism is a particular type class of isomerism when mirror images that cannot cannot be superimposed on each other so for instance these two compounds are mirror images of each other let this be a mirror for instance and this particular compound is a mirror image of this compound as you can directly see but for instance if you try to superimpose each uh, one on the other you won't be able to do that right because this would not go exactly on top of that so this is called optical isomerism next we will see what is linkage isomerism linkage isomerism is a class under structural isomerism this is due to ambidentate ligands for instance uh, this basically happens because the same what we've studied in ambidentate ligands earlier that the same ligand can donate from two atoms or more so for instance scn uh, can donate from s and can donate from n so we have something uh, a sort of a condition where uh, the metal is bonded to s in one case and to n in one case so for instance this particular compound can be ono or no2 as we studied earlier nitrito n and nitrito o uh, next you can see what is coordination isomerism coordination isomerism is another type of isomerism that happens because of interchange of ligands between the anionic and cationic complexes for instance this is a coordination isomer of the, uh, this is a coordination isomer of this particular compound because you just have an interchange of ligands right now chromium is bonded to nh3 in this case it's bonded to 6cn uh, ligands in this particular compound cobalt is bonded to cyanide ligands in this case it's bonded to amine ligands so that is the only difference that we have in these in this particular isomerism next we have ionization isomerism ionization isomerism is a particular type of isomerism when the dif there's a difference between the products when the particular compound is ionized so for instance this particular compound gives us bromine when we ionize it so in a solvent it will give br minus ligand uh, ions in this particular this particular compound gives out so4 2 minus ions when we ionize it in a solvent the next particular type of isomerism that we'll study is solvate isomerism this is very similar to what we studied earlier in ionization isomerism but the difference is that in this case we have a difference in the water number of water molecules so water is usually taken as a solvent and you just have the water molecule basically came outside the coordination sphere we had a cl go inside so we got cl2 outside and dot h2 because h2 is the solvent in this particular case so that is uh, the solvate isomerism 
So now the next concept you need to understand in this particular chapter is that of hybridization. This is just a recap from what you would have studied in chemical bonding in the other chapters in chemistry. Uh, this is something that we'll need in this chapter, so we'll just revise it once. You need to remember the shapes and the hybridization they cause. Uh, the important particular like metal orbitals that you'll need to remember for this particular chapter are the n minus one d, n s, n p, n d, where n usually is three or uh, four, where we have the three d, four s, four p involved. And really, we have a 4D involved. Uh, now, usual coordinations numbers that we study in this chapter are four. Uh, they have, they can possibly be sp3 or dsp2. Sp3 is a tetrahedral shape. Dsp2 is square planar. Uh, a five coordination number is a sp3d usually, and that has a tpp trigonal bipyramidal shape. Uh, a six coordination number can usually refer to d2 sp3 or sp3d2. Each of these are octahedral in shape. So you need to just remember this and keep this in mind for the later questions that we'll cover. Now the next thing in this chapter that we need to remember is the spectrochemical series. This particular series talks about the strength of ligands. So we have weak ligands in the form of I minus, then Br minus, and this is basically the increasing strength of ligands. Uh, carbonyl is the strongest ligand that we have that we'll be studying. Now a way that you can possibly remember this usually is that you can see which is the donating atom, like the atom which is donating it. If it is a uh, electronegative atom, then usually it'll be at the weaker end of the series that the, the ligand we are talking about. So for instance, something like like carbonyl cn minus en are usually donating from carbon carbon compound carbon right as an atom so that is why these are at the strong end of the ligand series uh, spectrochemical series and then we go on to n then we go on to o then we go on to the halogens and i minus is least electronegative most electronegative roughly this is not a like exact way that this particular series is derived but this is just a way to remember these the series because it is important to remember the series for you now the next concept in this chapter is that of CFSE splitting. Uh, first we'll discuss splitting for octahedral field. Now octahedral field, uh, this is say the free orbitals d, free d orbitals and energy level. Say this is all five are the same energy level. Now what happens is usually in octahedral field, the approach of ligands is along the axis. So if you draw the d orbitals, they'll be all they'll all be this way: dx, y, dy, z, dz, x, dx square, dash y square, and dz square. Now in this case, dz square and dx square dash y square lie along the axis, right? So we have along the xy axis over here, we have a den some density along the z axis and we have some amount of density along the x and y axis for the electron orbitals. Now what happens is when these are along the, uh, the orbitals are along the axis and the approach of ligands is also along the axis, there is some amount of repulsion, right? So when there is repulsion, it raises the energy level. So that is why those two particular orbitals are raised in energy level. And the other three, which are not along the axis, are lowered in energy level. So that is why this is, uh, let delta O be the total splitting. Z, uh, delta O is basically delta octahedral. And then we divide it as three by five and two by five because uh, it the barycenter, this particular point is called the barycenter, uh, needs to be at the same energy level. So three into two minus three into two is uh, zero. So that is basically what we, how we pile up these orbitals. Next, we will discuss the same thing for tetrahedral field. Uh, for tetrahedral field, we know that approach is along the faces. Now, in that case, what happens is it's uh, these part these two orbitals face lesser amount of repulsion, right? Then, because we have a uh, lesser in density along the axis in this case, uh, more density along the axis, and we have lesser density along the faces for these two sets of orbitals. So. These two orbitals are stabilized in energy and the other three which were uh, between the axes are raised in energy level. So that is why our net energy again continues to be the same. Uh, so we need to remember one more thing for this particular concept is uh, stronger ligands lead to greater splitting. We did the spectrochemical series earlier. So if it is lying at the strong end of the series, then it leads to greater splitting. You need to keep this also in mind for this particular concept. Now the next concept for this chapter is the common compounds which are there that we usually find. So this is something not very important for J, like this would not be asked very frequently for your J, but just to keep in mind that J still expects you to know this, we'll still cover it up for your knowledge. Uh, this is a particular compound which is used to precipitate selectively metal ions of Ni2 plus as a dimethyl glyoxide complex. So this is the particular complex that you can just keep in mind, just keep the structure in mind. Similarly, you have hemoglobin structures, a few other structures that you can just keep in mind, but they're not exactly very uh, oriented towards the questions that are asked in JE. So that's it about the theory for this chapter. Now we'll start with questions.